Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're at the quarter point of the season, and the Sea of Red is starting to get frustrated. As always, I'm Dan alongside Matt here to discuss, Matt, I think fair to say, another disappointing week of Flames hockey. Yeah, um, just to be on the optimistic side, everything has gone pretty much as badly as it has been possible this year other than don't like, jinx bunch... them they're gonna start losing who they're gonna lose more than huberto if you do you know it, and it's one of those things where despite like everything being not ideal they're nine nine and three and in a playoff spot and it, it's one of those things where they need to do a lot better and they have the ability and talent to be doing a lot better but you know even with everything being sideways they're still doing respectably and you know it's just frustrating because like this team should be up near where vegas is in the standings and like fighting for the division not you know behind edmonton in eighth I totally agree. And let's look at uh, what brought them to the frustration this week. Started off the week well. Calgary went to Philadelphia on this long road trip and ended up, I would say, easily taking care of the Flyers. Uh, the Calgary Flames ended up with a 5-2 win over the Flyers. Goals from Huberto, Dubé, Anderson, Coleman, and Lewis. What were your thoughts on this game, Matt? Um, Philadelphia has been good to start the season and then they ran into everybody getting hurt. And so the flames were playing a good portion of Philadelphia's farm system. And it, despite getting the win in this game, it was kind of a disappointing effort. Um, only winning by a single goal, uh, considering the fact that like literally only one of the better players for Philadelphia was in the lineup up front and you know like Calgary should have kind of walked away with this one and the fact that it was competitive until the last minute of the game it it was good to get the two points but uh it, they needed to be better I thought would you one. say in this one Philadelphia overperformed or Calgary underperformed uh, Calgary underperformed. I, I think Philadelphia gave it their all um, for what they had at their disposal. But, you know, it's like if the Flames ha suddenly had to play the top two lines of the Stockton Heat, I mean the Calgary Wranglers, um, on uh, in our lineup on our top six, like it, and then it go out and expect to win, like it, it's not really feasible in a, any realistic sense. and Even worse than to play as top two lines of the Stockton Heat, considering they're non-existent. True. <laughs> uh, but, you know, it's one of those things where I thought Philadelphia did a good job, and, you know, Calgary didn't really play all that great. And, it, you know, it's one of those where, like, it, great to get the two points, but it, it was a bit of a foreshadowing game for the rest of the week. And that's a good way to look at it for sure. And, you know, like you said, very, even on the stats outside of the score, very even for these teams. 50% each faceoffs, 0-2 on the power play for Calgary, 0-3 for the Flyers, 13 shots for Calgary, 11 for the Flyers. Like, it was a very even game from two teams that should not have been that even. No. And, like, realistically, Calgary should have mopped the floor with the Flyers as they were in that game. And it, it, there was no reason it should have been close. That's been the story of the Flames season, though. Yep. Then on November 23rd, the Calgary Flames uh, were on the road again, as they've been all week, and they went to Pittsburgh, um, taking on, for the second time in the last time of the season, Sidney Crosby and the Penguins. And a very close game in this one, Pittsburgh ended up with the 2-1 to -one win, um, with the shootout. What were your thoughts on this one? Um, I thought the Flames were outclassed in this game entirely and got a point in this one because Dan Vladar stood on his head. Vladar's last game was November 10th in this before this, and he played in this one. I would say that this might be the best goaltending performance we've seen this season. 
Yeah, and later on this week against Carolina, he was equally good. Um, and yeah, like this was literally the only reason why either the ga- game against Carolina or the Pittsburgh game uh, that we're talking about uh, were even remotely close. Um, I thought that the Penguins controlled the play for pretty much the entirety of the game. Calgary and- got dominated for two periods, and you got to give them. I think Calgary had a good second, but you got to give them credit. They fought hard for those points. Yeah. And, you know, it was nice to see Malkin. Or the point, I guess. Uh, getting the uh, winning goal on his uh, celebration of getting 1,000 games. Uh, you know, even though it sucks for us, but as a hockey fan, that was nice to see. I like that Huberdo and Anderson again scored on the shootout. Um, Anderson seems to be the shootout, one of the shootout heroes this year. We we haven't had many, but he's doing well with them. Yep, and it's one of those where Calgary just needs to find three reliable shooters, and I think between uh, those two and uh, Nazim Kadri, I do believe has been traditionally rather good over his career. Um, that. Uh, we'll at least have a solid trio for when it comes time to the, for those situations. Well, we're not done. There are four games this week. We're only halfway through. The next one, uh, Calgary was in Washington taking on the Capitals in what I think is one of the better, um, what are we calling them, reverse retro jerseys. I've, I always liked the Screaming Eagle. That's because when I grew up, I guess, that was the, the Capitals logo. It's the one I remember. Um, but... It obviously gave the Capitals some superpowers. Didn't help the Flames at all. Three to one loss to the Capitals. Uh, three nothing, wasn't it? Or oh, sorry, three nothing. You're right. Yeah. Um, Calgary just it. Well, look at the second goal that Kuznetsov scored. Like literally, Markstrom just had to be lying down on the ice, not doing anything, and he got out of the way of the puck going in the net. And like the flames can't seem to help themselves in any way shape or form and like i thought the flames had more offensive chances than washington in this but literally zero execution zero puck luck and zero drive to do anything beyond anything like it, it was a, a flat the line the flames performance. looked like they were frustrated and done didn't they yeah it, it was a very flat line performance like it, it reminded me of games like we've seen when we've had rebuilding seasons and we're in like the end of march early april where the games really don't matter and the teams give a <laughs> blank uh meter is at zero and like the team just didn't seem to have anything in the engine to turn over again statistic wise a very uh close game 50 percent face-offs four penalty minutes each 28 hits to 36 for the capitals 17 blocks each nine giveaways for the flames to 10 for the capitals like on paper a very a very close game but yeah it just seemed like the flames were done with this road trip yeah and it it's one of those things that um like, the Flames have been having a lot of their mistakes quickly end up in their own net. And uh, like the turnover to Kuznetsov uh, that ended up in that goal. And in the subsequent game uh, where turnovers were right in the net right after, um, there was a graphic in the game on Sportsnet yesterday uh, where... Uh, it showed that the Flames had surrendered the second most uh, goals off of turnovers and the 15 seconds, like, immediately after. And, like, only Ottawa, who's, I think, the worst team in the entire NHL, uh, had more. And, like, they had only one more uh, turnover resulting in an immediate goal against. And this whole team just seems to lack any mental focus or frankly like even just basics of the game at the moment where like just routine plays seem to be a challenge for them and it it just it's befuddling because of the fact that like this team was so good last year for the entirety of the season 
And yet this year, with most of the same guys playing just, you know, too loose in a lot of ways, where in terms of, like, just their mental focus on what they're doing. Let's come back to that thought. Mm -hmm. Last game of this trip, Carolina, the back-to-back game with the Capitals. This happened Saturday the 26th, and Dan Vladar once again gets the net. And the Hurricanes end up beating the Flames 3-2 to two in this one. The Flames battled back, I mean, to tie this game twice. They, It just, I don't know, it almost felt like the Flames were working a lot harder than they needed to. And it's one of those where, like, when Carolina took the 3-2 lead, I thought that they just kind of stopped playing um, after that. Like, there was no concerted effort to push back where like it, when they were down one nothing and two one they did actually push and like in the second period they actually controlled most of the second period until Tafoli scored and it, it's so when the Carolina Hurricanes were up by three the Hurricanes stopped playing or the Flames stopped playing the Flames okay um it, it just like it just didn't seem like the Flames uh had any fight after that uh, for whatever reason, and it was one of those games where, like, Vladar, like, if the goaltending had been a, well, a typical Flames goaltending performance, like, this game's probably 8-2 to two for Carolina. Like, uh, they had so many high-quality chances in the first period that, like, the fact that the Flames were tied after one, like, that really should have been a 5-1 score after one uh, for how badly they played. And, like, to enter the third period tied at two, like, the Flames should have been taking more of the approach of, well, hey, we kind of got away with not being the better team for the first 40 minutes. Uh, Let's go win the last 20. And then they gave up the goal early enough in the third period, and then, like, they just went home. Like, it it just... It's weird that this team is... Lacking the mental discipline. Yeah, they seem like they want to get off the road. It seems like they want to come home, and now they'll have that opportunity to do so. Um, but after this week, the Flames still sit at fifth in the Pacific Division with a 9-9-3 nine, nine, and three record, as you mentioned, Matt. That puts them at 500 for their point percentage. Uh, they are behind Edmonton at 22, LA at 26, Seattle at 27, Vegas at 33. And I guess, you know, you, you were talking about this, like they're, they seem so fragile mentally. And I think even outside of that, we're just not getting the seasons we need from some guys. Like, you know, um, Manjapani has to be better. Dubé has to be better. I think most of our forwards have to be better. Well, like I just, yeah, to single those two guys out, uh, specifically those two players, Manjapani and Dubé last year combined for nearly 60 goals between them. And this year they're on pace for, I think it's like 20, 21, something like that. Like they're, you know, and to expect them to be a 60 goal duo again this year would obviously be lofty because they had career years last year. But, you know, like they should be generating like 40, 45, you have to 50 goals. to the mean. Yeah, it, but, like, this is, like, way overcorrecting for, like, how good they were last year. Like, both of them, frankly, are not playing at a level where they should actually be out on the ice as NHL players, frankly, on either account. And it, you know, it's one of those things where it's getting to a point where you look at the guys on the farm team and maybe you recall two and sit the pair of them for a bit. So let's let's have that discussion. This one that we got asked this week uh, on Twitter by Veer at Veer Flames ninety one, and he asked us to talk about the call up situation with the team tr- struggling to score. Would you? He would like to hear every option possible on that. So let's let's jump right into that. I think we definitely need to shake up the the forward group. And now that Michael Stone is back and Gilbert's been assigned to the farm, the Flames have about 1.6 million in cap space so they can afford to bring a guy up if they want to and still bank a little bit of cap room. 
I think really there's probably four guys that you would look at bringing up. One of them might be Matthew Phillips, who after tonight is now the goal and point leader of the AHL. One would be Connor Zari. One would be uh, probably uh, Jacob Peltier. And I think if we're going to look at forwards, you got to throw Cole Schwint in there as well. The organization seems to be high on him. Let's break down each one of those guys and where they might fit in the lineup. Yeah. So, Matt, why don't we start with Zari? Well, Connor's... Who do you, put, who, who, who do you take out? Where do you put him? Well, even though Connor Zari is a center, I think uh, starting him off on the third line wing uh, alongside Backlund and Coleman for him makes the most sense because he's very much a two-way forward in the same way that uh, Dylan Dubé is a solid two-way forward uh, up until this year. Uh, <laughs> and it, it for him, like he needs to learn how to be effective on both ends of the ice, so when he transitions back to center at the NHL level, because even when he gets recalled full-time, I don't expect him to just step in as a center because the Flames tend to put them on the wing for a bit and then move them to center. Um, and then uh, I think having Backlund and Coleman with them uh, to kind of shepherd him along on both ends of the ice, I think would be a ideal fit. See, I don't know if I would put him at, um, at, Wing, like I know what you're saying, but I think if you're going to call a guy up and you want him to show the best, you got to put him where he's comfortable. And I think if you're bringing up a center, you got to put them at center. I think right now, if you bring him up, you leave him at center. You probably see, and it's tough because, like, who do you take out? You've got Lindholm, Kadri, Backlund, who all have to stay in there. So you don't want to put, yeah, it's it's tough in that way. You don't want to put um, Zari on the fourth line. Yeah. Like, unless you're uh, remaking the fourth line, like, if you were to say demote, um, like, one of Dubé or uh, Manjapane down to the fourth line uh, to go along with Zari, then that would be a feasibility that would make sense. If you were willing to sit out Lucic and you were to put, say, Dubé or even, I would say even Richie and Rooney or something on there with them, it might make sense, but it's still, uh, I don't know. I like, yeah, I don't know. I wouldn't promote Zari right now just because no, I don't know where he fits. No, me either. And it, exactly for that reason, I think Zari will be best served getting first line minutes in the AHL and being like the go to guy. Uh, so that way, like next year or the year after when he gets recalled, he can just immediately transition into a top nine role. I agree. Well, let's go to the one guy that I think most Flames fans wanted to see. Uh, since training camp, and that's Jacob Peltier. Yeah. Um, where where would you put Jacob? Well, Peltier is a feistier uh, two-way forward um, and a very good scoring forward. Uh, right the, winger, right shot. Yeah, I'd, I'd put him on the second line um, to start. With who uh, do you take out? Kadri and Majapane to start. Although, it, in my ideal situation uh for what i would do personally is i would recall both phillips and peltier together at the same time and put them with cadre so you would so you'd take dubay and manjapani right out of the lineup i'd move you pr- i'd move you du- them? i would move dubay down to the third line and i'd sit manjapani for a bit just to like yeah. it's sort it's one of those things where manjapani and dubay both uh like Dubé last year, he sat out for three games and then he markedly improved. And I think both of them might need some time off the ice in order to see and learn. And, you know, I think that they got a little comfortable with uh, Kachuk and uh, Goudreau leaving that, like, well, we're the guys now and it's sort of like not having to try it as hard because like your spot's already established and they're not doing any of the things that made them successful in the first place and i think they need a little bit of time off or a demotion to kind of kick them in the butt to get them going again yeah and i think even just that thought that hey someone else is here in your spot earn it back yeah, because, like, frankly, right now, neither one of them is really playing at an NHL level. 
Um, like, they're getting gifted second-line minutes when, like, with the amount of and lack of their production, like, frankly, if you put Lucic and Richie on the second line with Kadri, I think you'd get about the same amount of offensive production. And it it's... Like, that's not good or a compliment to either one of those players. And they have so much more in them, and the team needs them to be better. And you can't just, you know, skate around being, well, we're the second line guys without actually doing any of the things that show that you're actually second line talent. No, I agree. And I think if I was, I mean, if we look at bringing one of them up, and if we look at Peltier. I think at that point I would I think I would probably reform that second line then and try Kadri Huberto Peltier because I want to send a message I'd take Dubé out and I'd demote Mongepani. I think yeah, we can we I can agree. probably do do without Dubé. I think you want to keep Mongepani in if you can cuz you got to get him going. Yeah. And it's one of those things that like with the Mongepani as as strong as this is going to sound like if he plays at this level for the remainder of the season he's a buyout candidate frankly because the flames will only be on the hook for one third of his contract instead of two thirds and at 5.8 million like the extra four million you'd save you could get a good player for four million that's going to go from being the bread man to sourdough if he keeps playing like this. Yeah, and like that's uh, you know, and it's not funny or nice to say, but it, it's one of those where you have to perform at a level, and when you're playing that poorly, uh, like you have to look at all options, and you know, like when you're on pace for ten goals, like that's ridiculous for five point eight million, like. No, <laughs> no, I agree. And 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 if we did if we did that if we took Dubé out and put Rajichka there, I think then having um, Backland, Coleman, and uh, probably Rajichka as your third line, or actually, sorry, it'd be Backland, uh, Mangiapane, and Rajichka is what I'd probably do there, or Coleman. But I think Backland Mangiapane could be what what Andrew needs to get going. Yeah, and uh, a more defensive minded center. Yeah, and it's one of those things that, you know, it's about confidence levels. And, you know, like the other day when he scored last week that, you know, it looked like he was starting to do the things that he needed to do and was playing with a little more intensity. And then he scored a goal and then all of that went away again. And it's, how would you say with this team uh, organizationally, um, cause like I've heard some rumblings that like fans are upset about Daryl and like, oh, you should fire Daryl and you know, stuff like that. And to me, it's more like if the players can't perform for Daryl, get rid of the players. Um, because he, he, you know, we saw that, uh, how the team underperformed for years with other coaches and, you know, Sutter has a proven track record and. It's one of those where, like, the guys need to actually be accountable for themselves and to each other, and we're just not seeing it right now. And it's getting later in the season where somebody actually has to step up and show some leadership and, you know, take the reins of, like, I am going to kick some butt and go and actually score goals instead of, you know, this waffling play that we've been seeing for... I don't think the coach is the problem at this point. No. And, you know, it's frustrating because... Like, if especially, like, when you look at, like, the underlying numbers for the team, like, generally the Flames are out-shooting the teams that they're facing. They're generally out-chancing the teams, and they've been getting some suspect goaltending from Markstrom and Vladar at times. And... It, you know, it, it's been a confluence of everything going wrong, and if they can straighten it out, then they should be fine. But, you know, it takes a collective effort to actually get out of your own way. And, like, right now, we're just not seeing that, and it's frustrating because they do show the pl flashes of the potential of being better, but with no consistency. Well, as part of trying to uh, get better, I think the last guy we need to look at is Matthew Phillips, another right winger, 
Um, he's now the goal and point leader of the AHL. And to me, the guy who's the most likely to get called up of the group we've talked about. Um, I think if you bring Phillips up, you put him with Huberto and Backlund. Uh, I'd actually, uh, I agree with Huberto, but I think putting him with Huberto and Kadri makes the most sense. See, uh, I would probably promote Huberto Backlund to my second line with him there and then move Kadri with whoever you're randomly going to put him with your second line. Yeah. Or your third line, I mean. Uh, it depends on, like, who you're going to put, you know, because in my vision, uh, like, Ruzhitska plays with Lindholm and Toffoli because that's just working right now. Uh, if you put Huberto with Kadri and uh, Phillips, like, you have three skill offensive guys. You put Manjapane with Backlund and Coleman to kind of take some of the pressure off of Dub or Manjapane to you know, get him going again. And then the fourth line of Lucic, Dubé, and whomever, whether it's... So who's on your second line? Is Kadri Phillips and who? Huberto. Okay. Yeah, I could, I could totally see that. And I think, you know, I, I've said this for a while. If you're going to bring up a guy you project to be in the top six, you have to give him top six minutes. You can't bring up a, a guy you think might be a one or two line forward to your fourth line. It's just not helping them at all. So no, yeah, and I think, it, it, and if you're trying to get, if you're trying to get the offense going, you got to get these guys in a position. They can do that. Yeah. And how would you say like uh Phillips because of his small size, he's needed the time in the AHL to mature fully. So that way he's a plug and play, not a plug in and learn at the NHL level, then be good. Like he pretty much, needs to be able to be airlifted, dropped in on a second line and say, go to it. And, you know, like he is now, because he is the most talented player in the AHL, that it's one of those where you have to just kind of let him rip at the NHL level and he'll either sink or he'll swim and, you know, it's up to him. And, you know, it, he needs to be given that opportunity. The Flames play Tuesday night here in Calgary. The uh, Wranglers do not play again until the weekend, so it might be very easy. They're at home right now to make that call up for Tuesday and then send somebody back down for the weekend if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think with the salary cap now, with having uh, Stone back, I, I think they've got to do something, and this is the easiest thing to do is bring one of those three guys up. And to me, I don't want to disrupt Phillips's flow or the Stockton Heat flow, so I think I would probably bring Phillips up for Tuesday's game, try him out here, and if you need to, send him back on the road with the team after he gets that NHL shot on the weekend. Um, and, I mean, if he's good, keep him around. But, yeah, I don't know. I, I think that they've got to do something. And Yeah, like this is a team that, like, where, like, they're struggling to a point where, like, a trade to shake the team up or a recall or a firing of a coach just in a general sense makes sense to get them all out of their and the own easiest head. those things a recall yeah uh, that's the least expensive option <laughs> i think you try that before you do the others yeah because like especially like a trade uh right now doesn't really make any sense just due to the fact that the flames uh, like, it doesn't make sense to add if the team's going to continue to struggle and fade into non-playoff zone level of bad. So, I also think if you look at most of the teams I would want to make a trade with, they're not quite sure probably at this point what they are yet. No. So your price is going to be higher because of that. Mm -hmm. So, Matt, we've talked about calling guys up from the AHL. The Flames did make a transaction the other way this week with Michael Stone back in the lineup after the... Uh, Carolina game or during the Carolina game that means that Dennis Gilbert has been sent down to the AHL Wranglers and that makes Connor Mackey uh, the seventh defenseman again up here in Calgary do you think that's the way we're going to see this defense break down let's just assume that we're not getting Shillington back in anytime soon do you think that we see Mackey as seven and Gilbert uh, in the AHL or do you think the Flames will try to put Mackey through waivers give him some AHL time, and, and I think Gilbert has maybe earned that number seven time. Well, I think that uh, for the time being, just for ease of use, um, he being the number seven as the in-case-of-emergency guy is adequate, but Gilbert played significantly better than Mackey has this year, and if there's uh, more than like one or two game 
uh, issue for any of the defensemen, I would expect Gilbert to be recalled. And I thought he played rather well in his role for the minutes that he had. Like, he wasn't I great, agree. but he wasn't bad in any way, shape, or form. Do you think the team might be a little more gun-shy about sending Mackey down just because they already lost a defenseman on waivers? Uh, a little, but I, I think that it's just... Um, Easier to keep uh, him up and sending, like, there's no risk at all of waivers or anything. Um, and it also helps uh, the farm team a little bit more with Gilbert getting recalled or resent down, assigned to uh, the Wranglers instead. Yeah, I don't disagree. And I think that, you know, Gilbert is going to do better playing hockey and I think playing at the HL level than he will sitting on the bench. Um, and I think, you know, like you said, we probably have Mackie here just because he's good enough to fill in once in a while on that bottom pair. But I can see them put, calling Gilbert back up before the next road trip just to have some some extra depth there. Yeah, it, it's one of those that it, because it's uh, so minor at the moment um, that I think just letting it pass until it's kind of six one half dozen the other is the number seven yeah like it, it's kind of who cares at the moment uh because they're not needing to play on any sort of regular basis it's not like a backup goaltender where you have to play them at some point um it, the guy could literally sit as the number seven for the next three months and not play a single game so it literally until it's necessary who cares <laughs> And with that transaction, as I mentioned earlier, the Flames now have uh, about one point two five million. Oh, sorry, one point six eight seven million, according to Cap Friendly, under the under the cap. So even if they were to call up, uh, if they were to call up Phillips, he's making seven hundred fifty thousand. They'll still be able to bank some cap for the deadline, which I think is going to be important for this team right now. Yeah, and it, it's one of those things that I think that they need a kick in the pants uh, sooner than later. And, like, I, I, frankly, I think that them calling up Phillips anywhere in the next week or so uh, or two makes the most sense just as kind of like a trial run to the trade deadline. Um which we mentioned I last think you, week. I think you've got to make that call up, but you've also got to be willing to stick with it. You've got to be willing to say, okay, Phillips is doing good. We're going to keep him here and take somebody else out of the lineup. And I think if they're not willing to follow through with the threat, if you will, it's sort of like, you know, when your parents say, or else, or yeah. else what? Or else, right? Like, you know, if, if they're not willing to take a guy like Japani out or take a guy like Dubé out, then I don't know how much that's going to help them. Yeah, and it, it's one of those where guys really do need to start playing better. And we've seen got the first line respond. Like Lindholm, Toffoli, and Ruzitska have played very well over the past two, three weeks. And Ruzitska, I think, is starting to cool off. Yeah, but he he's still contributing. Like it, It's not like the line has died because he's out there. You know, and, like, we knew that he wasn't going to be at, like, a nearly two-point-per-game pace like he was on last week. But it, it it's one of those where, like, he's not hurting the team. And so the second and third lines, though, they are hurting the team. And especially the second line. And it's not Nazim Kadri's fault. Like, he's played poorly himself lately, but he is literally carrying two fourth line non regular players on his line for the whole season and it's hard to generate everything yourself when your line mates are playing that poorly and it, you know the the team needs a shake up as we're now at the quarter point of the season who do you think's been the flames best player in the first quarter uh nikita zadorov interesting answer I think he's the only one who's exceeded expectations even a little bit, and he's exceeded them quite a bit. But um, pretty much everybody else has been as, as expected. Like, Hannafin Anderson have played at the level I'd expect them to. 
everybody else in the lineup though has been bad for them. I'm going to say, and I, I know what you're saying about Zadorov. I'm going to say Lindholm. I think Lindholm is not breaking out, but I think he's been consistent in what he is. And I think he's very much a, a two-way center, not your you know offensive dynamo. But I think Lindholm, every time he's been on the ice, has given that line a chance to be successful and has really helped Adam Rujicka with his development. Yep, I agree. Uh, he would have been my second choice, so not far off on that. Well, Matt, we've got two other uh, two other emails this week. Um, let's start with another one here, talking about lines and players. Um, we got an email, or sorry, this was a yeah, this was an email from Joseph in BC. He didn't say where in BC he is. Maybe he's in Canucks country, and that's why. Um, he asks, "Who are the ideal line mates for Huberto right now?" His email goes on to say that he likes him with number eleven but he's not sure who should be the third guy on that line, or maybe we don't like him with number 11 and want to put him somewhere else. Who do you think? Um, honestly, like Backlund is a serviceable guy to pair him with for the short term, but he needs better scorers on his line and like players that can actually score on his line. And like, he needs to be playing with, some of the better players on the team. Like, that's why I started with Lindholm and Toffoli. Chemistry-wise, that didn't work initially. Um, it might be possible to reunite them, but with uh, Rajitska playing so well, it the, that's less of an emphasis. So, ideally, I'd put him with Kadri and Phillips, frankly. Um, I, I think that the, none of the internal options on the second line are palatable um, with Kadri and Huberdeau at the moment. I don't mind Huberdeau and Backlund. I think that Backlund gives Huberdeau a, some defensive responsibility he needs, but my issue there is Backlund can't be any higher than the third line in the current lineup. He's not going to overtake Kadri. He's not going to overtake Lindholm as the one, two centers, and you can't have Huberdeau on the third line. So I think you have to find a way to make him work with either Kadri or Lindholm. I think, like you said, Kadri's probably the right place to go now. Yeah, like it, on it would be paper, one thing like if Rujitsko was playing bad because then you just try Lindholm with Toffoli again and Huberdo again and see if a couple months into the season if it works now where it didn't earlier. But with Rujitska playing well enough, it, it's you know, and the second line being bad, that it's one of those where maybe you can fix the the secondary problem while leaving the first one alone. I think, you know, when I look at this on paper, not looking at actual production, but if I'm looking at just guys and where they should be producing, I would say that the second line right now should be Huberto, Kadri, Mangiapane. Yeah. Um, but because he's not performing, I think you've got to go with Kadri, Huberto, like you said, Phillips, I think would work well there. Um, I would even be willing to experiment a little bit and go Rujicka, Lindholm, Mangiapane, Huberto, Kadri to Foley. Yeah, I could see that too. I uh, think just swa it's one swapping of, some guys around on those top two lines might see really what the the pairs are. Yeah, it's one of those where, like, a lot of the Flames' problem really stems from the fact that the second line has been so abysmal. Because, like, literally, unless the first line is going and you're getting the occasional help from the third and fourth line, like because there's no secondary options like the team it, it's easy to defend against it's easy to shut down and you can you're making it very easy for the other teams because they don't need to worry about the second line at, at right now at all and like they can send their second and third defense pairings without any worry that they're going to actually get scored on and they can focus their best defensive guys on the first line, which just makes it everything much more difficult for this team to actually win games. Um, and, like, the team needs secondary scoring. And if we're not getting any help from the second line, like, that really needs to change. Just because we're, you know, I'm just thinking about what I like about Backlund there. And, like I said, I like with him sort of that defensive responsibility that Backlund brings. Um, I'm thinking, okay, if we're looking to blow things up, 
A guy who hasn't looked bad, in my opinion, but looks as advertised has been Coleman. I think we're overpaying Coleman to be on the third line, but that's what he is at this point. I would even try Hubert Kadri Coleman on the second line. Yeah, and that wouldn't be necessarily a bad option either. Like Coleman, if, if like, you don't want to make a call up and then you move Dubé and Mangiapane down and yeah. make Dubé Backlund Mangiapane. Yeah, and it's one of those where Coleman, like he can score. He is hit 20 goals before and is perfectly viable as a second line uh winger the team just needs better f- period from that second line and it, it, whatever the permutation is uh they just need to get more production and huberto yeah. is and i think huberto's kind of stalled on the third line just because the other two guys are not Primary. And I, I think he's doing as good as we can ask him to do on the third line right now. I think Huberto's finally got going, is my thought, but mm-hmm. he's going as well as he can on the third line. I agree. I think by the end of the season, you're going to see Huberto back with Lindholm and Toffoli. I think as he starts to figure out the Calgary game and gets more comfortable here, I think that's where he will end up ultimately is back on that first line. Oh, I agree. And I think it's just uh, a matter of, every, you know, everybody getting more comfortable. And it's just, you know, uh, between now and, say, January, uh, February, like the team needs to get some sort of immediate solution that will work at, and result in them winning some games just to erase the wall at the start of the year. And then, you know, look at, you know, finer detailing once that's been accomplished. And, you know, like, who knows? Like, Ruzhitska might play well enough where, like, if he plays at, like, a 25-30 goal pace like he's on currently, you know, that's perfectly fine. You don't necessarily need to switch that out. And, you know, then it's, okay, figure out the second line. and Well, and, you know, for Zizka's playing above his head with Lindholm to Foley, like you said, maybe it's Huberto, Kadri, and Phillips plays above his head with those guys. And we sort of, yeah. well, we know it's not long-term solutions past 2023. We can patch the holes for now. Yeah. And it's not like Ruzitska is going to all of a sudden demand a $6 million contract if he scores 25 or 30 goals this year. It, so, you know, like the team will... Well, in, in your scenario, you buy out the bread man, you give Ruzitska his money. Well, it's one of those where, you know, put it this way, if Manjapani and Dubé can get out of their own way, and, like, return to being at, like, a 40-goal pace for the season, then, you know, like, everything's fine. It's just, you know, they they need to not be disastrously bad. And, like, they've both been disastrously bad. Like, frankly, like, if the Flames were playing uh, uh, Rooney and Lewis and, you know, insert farm guy here, like, say, Walker Dewar in the lineup, you wouldn't really notice any difference if Manjapani and Dubé weren't in the lineup other than we'd hit a little more. Like that's how poor the offensive production has been that you could literally have two non like a 13 and 14th forward in the lineup and okay, (laughs) you know, uh, you know, and if you want to send a message to guys, I think if we're honest, you're not going to move Manjapani mid season, but if I'm, if, if one of these farm guys comes up and does well and I'm Dylan Dubé, I think $2.3 million in Dubé's deal would be easily movable if the Flames needed to get something. I would probably be worried if I was him if, you know, any of the guys we talked about starts to play well that, oh, crap, you know, they might move on from me. Yeah. And, and, and that's what you want. You want them to to have i think a little bit of that fear yeah well and it's one of those where like guys realistically need a kick in the pants like you're not guaranteed anything and if you're not playing well you are replaceable and you know like we saw with uh trading a sean monahan that you know like yeah they could have just stayed with monahan and it would have been okay 
but they ended up getting a sizable upgrade in getting Nazim Qadri in terms of the overall talent of the player for about the same actual cap hit. Uh, by dipping into free agency. And, you know, like, if you're taking, like, Dubé's $2.3 million out of the lineup and replacing it with a free agent, you can get a very good second, third line guy for $2.3 well, million. Well, I'm even thinking if Flames want to make a deal around the deadline and just need some money, they might say, you know what, let's take Dubé out of the lineup, let's bring up Phillips at seven fifty, and, you know, we're and then bring in somebody else, you know, as well. Oh, yeah, and, you know, well, put it this way, like with uh, Manjapane's deal, like, you know, you might, uh, like, if you're looking at a rebuilding team that, uh, you know, who has a star player that wants to be uh, acquired by the Flames, you might include that player just to ditch his $5.8 million cap hit um, so that way you can afford the player. In the trade. Yeah, I think this. I think right now this team's invested in Manjapani, and I think they're willing to give him a, a bad year. Oh, um, I, I agree. But I think I think Dubé, and I've said this before. I think Dubé is expendable for the Flames right now. I agree, and it's one of those where, like, and how do you say? It? I'm not saying like, oh, ditch Manjapani right now. It's. One of those, though, that in order to be realistic, if the, he does not, you know, pull up from the tailspin that he's in, you know, like, all of a sudden, other options come available. And, like, how we saw with the team in the off season of, like, okay, Kachuk and Goudreau don't want to be here. Let's go get players that are going to contribute. And... You know, it's one of those where, like, frankly, uh, loyalty to long term, if, like, the players aren't producing, then, you know, all options should be on the table. And, you know, it's frustrating because, like, I like Manjapane. Like, I actually debated getting his name on a, a jersey because uh, I bought one of those. But I think that's where the Calgary and... Flames sometimes err is they put too much. They, they're too loyal in a lot of cases. Yeah. And that's where it's one of those where, you know, the team needs to be a little bit more realistic. And like if certain personnel aren't producing, switch them out. And... You know, it's up to the players. Like, if they want, don't want to be here, and, like, with their lack of production, they're showing that they're not playing at that level, then you have to do something. If they turn it around and play great, that's fine. But, you know, like, this team needs to have more of a fight for everybody that's wearing your jersey, <laughs> you know, attitude and all for one, one for all, and contributing in whatever area they're successful at. And, uh, like those two guys have not, they've drastically not been doing anything. That's a positive contribution thus far this year. Well, the last uh, question we have from our listeners this week comes an email from Jack and Jack said, Dan Vladar has arguably looked like the better goaltender this year. Is he ready for a starter job? And I will, let's, let's, clarify this a little bit i don't think that you necessarily make him the starter right away but do you think matt that we start to maybe put vladar in successive starts do you think maybe you go okay he's gonna let's call it start the week or start say three in a row or something like that uh this is starting to remind me of the 16 17 season uh for the flames where uh Elliot started really good at the beginning of the year. Then he tailed off. Then uh, Chad Johnson played really well in November. Then he tailed off. Then Elliot played good again. And, like, they kind of traded off hot streaks on the goalies. And, you know, Markstrom has been terrible. Like, you know, no, not sugarcoating it. He's been one of the three or four worst goalies in the NHL this year. Um, and Vladar up until this week has not been much better this week though. Vladar has been legitimately awesome. And I think you have to just run with whoever's hot at this point. And Vladar is showing that he's playing at an NHL level and, uh, 
better than average starting level. And Markstrom's showing that he's not looking like an NHL goalie either. <laughs> and it's one of those that, you know, like with allowing so many soft goals every game. And it's one of those until Markstrom gets out of his funk, he should ride the pine. And, and you know, a wake-up call to him of, like, you have to play well too. Like, you can't give up horrendous goals. Say, if we're doing it for the forwards, we have to do it for the goalies too. Yeah. If we're going to say, you know, we need to sit out some guys – on the you know the top uh, end of the lineup on the you know forward twelve, I think we need to do the same for goalies. Yeah, well, like the, how many games have we lost this year where Markstrom lets in a supremely weak goal that just kills the team in that game? And like it's not been one or two. Like it's and like it, frankly, like if Markstrom had been playing like Markstrom was last year, the team probably is up where, where Vegas is with all of the other stuff going on, <laughs> you know, and I agree. you know, it, it's not good to have your goaltender allowing such weak goals like the Kuznetsov goal or that, uh, one, a few games, uh, like last week where the weak point shot right after we had scored the goal in Tampa Bay and like just so many goals where it's like, come on, dude. Like, you know, like you have to actually stop a puck every once in a while. And, you know, it's one of those where, you know, Vladar stood on his head in both the Penguins and, uh, Hurricanes games. You know, and did everything to get the team two points, and they only managed one out of the four, but that's not on him. I think you guys have to I, ride with You were him. mentioning how this reminded you of sixteen seventeen. To me, I'd go all the way back to 0304. I think the Calgary Flames went into that season with Roman Turek expected to be... I mean, and I guess the difference for me is Ladar isn't streaky. It's not like one's getting hot. Ladar's been hot since camp, I think. Yeah. Um, but, you know, we went into the 0304 season with Roman Turek, Firmly in number one, the Flames made a trade for a uh, guy you might have heard of, Mika Kiprasov, who uh, was expected to be the backup, if not kind of the third goalie, and he ended up stealing the starting job. Yeah, and that's why, like, in previous years, like, when we were doing, like, our draft preview shows and all that, like, I'd mention adding a young goaltender until you find somebody that takes that spot. And Vladar you know, he very well could step in and take the starting job from Markstrom. And, you know, he's the right age. He's only 24. And, you know, he's had good numbers throughout his entire career. You know, like, it's an, he's certainly has the pedigree to be a starting goaltender in the NHL, and he has the size and athleticism to do so. So... Like, would it be a shock if he all of a sudden became a really good starting goaltender? No. And it, it, But, you know, every every starter had to get some coach's faith at some point, right? And I think that yeah. this might be the time to... And when I look at the coming week, and we'll talk about the December schedule here in just a minute, but when I look at the coming week, I think now is the time to give Vladar that chance. Yep. And it, it's like with uh, all the, the young players, and like Sutter even mentioned it with Connor Mackey, of like you're given an opportunity, you know, it's on you to actually take it. And, yep. you know, he was given an opportunity to play against Crosby and the Penguins. And we got a point out of a game that we should have lost easily. So he got another one against Carolina, and he played, he was the only reason why that one wasn't a blowout. And,. So it's like, okay, you're given an opportunity, you're given another opportunity, and you, you pass the, the tests on both, keep going. And it's just like Ruzitska, he was thrown haphazardly on the first line because there wasn't really anywhere else to stick him at that precise moment, and he took the ball and ran with it. And whether that lasts or not, you know, that's on him, just like Vladar, if he gets plenty of starts and he wins them all, well then, hey, job's yours, bud. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you don't really want to pay six million to your backup, but at the same time, you want to find the right guy. And if you know, I think you've got to give Vladar the chance. Like you said, you've got to give him the chance to do show if he's got it or not. And if you put him in net for this week where there's no back to back, and you give him Florida, Montreal, Washington, and Arizona, 
I think you you've given them a good ch- even if you give them the Minnesota game at the end of that homestand. I think you've given them a good chance to show what he is or what he isn't. Yeah, and at some point, you know, like Markstrom's going to get the net again, and you know, hopefully, if you know Markstrom's given a week or two where he's the backup that it kicks him in the pants enough where he starts to tighten up his game. And, you know, if at the end of the day, like Vladar only has like a small hot streak where he's good for five or six games. And then Markstrom takes over and plays more like Markstrom usually does, then, you know, that will be a successful thing for both him and uh, Markstrom. And, you know, it's one of those where, you know, the the team just needs, frankly, NHL caliber goaltending at this point. And, you know, up until this week, we have not really seen much of that um, this season. So, frankly, going anything to, that gets us to that point <laughs> where we're getting, like, Going legitimate... to Jack's question, I'm, I'm not ready to say Vladar's the starter at this point, but I'm willing to give him the homestand, the five-game homestand. Um, and then we have a, a back-to-back on the road, Columbus and Toronto. And I think if you give him the homestand and then you put Markstrom back in for the Columbus game and see what Markstrom can do, unless Vladar craps the bet earlier, yeah, I would be okay if the team says, all right, Dan, it's your net. Run with it. Show us what you can do. Yeah, or even if you give him four of the five on the homestand and, you know, again, as you said, see what you can do. And, like, with the upcoming schedule, like, the Flames are going to be playing, like, after that Toronto game, like, the quality of the teams that they play after that point drops off significantly. So, whether it's Markstrom regaining the net and playing as good as Markstrom can, or uh, if Ladar just takes the job and runs with it for all of December, you know, either way, things will be a little easier on both the goalies, after the Toronto game, it's just, you know, getting through the next seven uh, to see, you know, it who looks better at that point. And hopefully one of them takes the reins and runs with it. And I know in conversing with Jack a little bit by email this week, he even suggested play Vladar till he loses. But I think, and I said this to Jack, if you want to see if he's a starter, a big part of a starter's job is bouncing back after a loss. I think you've got to commit to giving him three, four, five, however many games, and unless he looks really terrible, like he lets in six goals or something, I think you've got to say, okay, you lost, but you're going back in because that's that's one of the keys of a starter. They can go back and play and shake off a loss. Yeah, and, you know, like young pl- all young players, he needs to learn how to be consistent at the NHL level where, you know, and, like, there were plenty of games in 3 4 just to bring it back to that, where Kiprasov would let in five-plus goals. And every time he did, he'd win the next game. And he literally did all the way through the playoffs. That Every time he gave up five-plus, a W would be on the next game. And, you know, the ability to get back on that horse and, you know, stop slides or stop protracted losing streaks uh, is a necessary thing to learn at the NHL level. And, you know, Ladar does have a track record of being really good. Uh, that's it, it was just one of those where he was stuck in a three-way race in Boston and he was the third guy. <laughs> and, you know, Allmark and uh, Swayman took the, the top two spots and he got traded here. But, and again, I don't want to say that he's going to be as good as Kipper, but very eerily similar to the Kipper stuff story. He was number three in St. Louis or in San Jose when he got traded here. Yeah, and it, who knows, you know? And it's not like he's a short goalie, or you know, like there's other question marks about him. Like stylistically, he looks very similar to Markstrom, and he's basically the same height. You know, there's an inch between them, and you know, like if one of them the two is playing at that elite level, then Hey, awesome. (laughs) You know, and you can start adding a lot of W's to the wind column, uh, in short order at that point, if you're getting that caliber of goaltending, it's just at this point, uh, like frankly, myself, I don't care which one of them does. Somebody has to, (laughs) and you know, like, I don't really care which one, (laughs) frankly, like as long as pucks are 
being stopped and the team's not losing because of weak goaltending, then I agree. You know, that's you the know important what? If, part. <laughs> if Markstrom's not the guy, again, you know, we've already budgeted for him this year, work it through the year as him as the number two, and we'll figure it out in the off season. Yeah. Oh yeah, and how would you say like there are a ton of teams every year that need goaltending? Um, so like if the Flames needed to trade Markstrom at the end of the year, there are a bunch of teams that would be more than happy to take yeah him. Like, and I don't and I don't at this point want to have Ladar Wolf as my pair. I don't think that's right, but I think you could trade Markstrom and then bring in another let's say veteran backup for. The remainder of the year, maybe into next year. Yeah. Like, you know, you're looking at like the James Reimer type guys exactly, or Aiden yeah. Hill or, you know, insert miscellaneous quasi yeah. starting goaltender. You know, serviceable but I think, guy. But I think like, I think like um, Mongepani, you can't just say, well, he had a bad season. Off you go. Like, I think you got to give him part of next season to try and come back. Oh, true. And how do you say there's no pressure? Like, it, in the same way, like, uh, um, because of the fact that, uh, like, the Flames have a dearth of good goaltenders in the system, that, like, there's no, uh, like, immediate urgency. Like, if he doesn't, like, perform right now, like, there are other options where you can throw Vladar in, and if Vladar is playing well, then there, you know, so what if Markstrom sits for a bit until he can work things out in practice and then apply that when he does return to the net? And But, like, with Manjapane and Dubé, like, if they're not scoring, they're not really doing anything else that's a positive yeah. contribution. And that then it becomes, like, you're just a liability out there, period. And that... I have to think Markstrom's got to be hurt. Like, for him to be playing the way he is, there's got to be something there. So let's get him off the ice for a little bit and get it looked at. And yeah, treated. whatever. Uh, and it's one of those where uh, Markstrom's had issues at, at times in the past where, you know, like this kind of thing has happened and it can be just mental whatever um, and things just not working for him right now. And, like, that's why having a solid secondary option with Vladar like if Vladar is playing well enough like you could have uh, Vladar playing eight out of ten games for a stretch and like if Markstrom when he does play the the on occasion game like if he's not playing at a higher level than he has been then you know you're just kind of stuck putting Vladar back in and until Markstrom can show that he's playing back at his normal which you know it's a good thing to have a good backup <laughs> like Vladar. For sure. And and I think, you know, going back to the email, I don't know I would say Vladar is going to become the number one, but I could see maybe a 1A, 1B for a good portion of the season. Yeah, and it's one of those with any young goaltender, you know, sometimes it just clicks and then you're all of a sudden that guy forever until, you know, like you're 38, 39, 40. You know, and there's p countless guys who've throughout, you know, like every team has one guy who just all of a sudden was kind of in this situation where he's the backup to the veteran starter and he just took the job and it was his. And, you know, it's, you don't really, goalies are such a voodoo that it's so hard to determine, like, is this guy going to be that or is he going to just be the okay backup? who knows until you get there <laughs> and then even then who knows until you get there <laughs> you know and we'll we'll, we'll yeah. wait and see how this homestand plays out yeah it, it's there's even like if Vladar plays great for the rest of the season that's no guarantee that he's the starter next year because no we've seen a lot of guys look good for a season and then i would say go back to backup status yeah so it's kind of one of those we have to just wait and see until like you get two or three or four years of consistency out of them that, okay, yeah, you are that guy. And then, you know, then that's your new starting goaltender for the long term and yada, yada, yada. We'll see what happens. Yep. But as we turn the page on November and look ahead to December, the Calgary Flames have 16 games in 31 days. They're pretty much playing every other day for this whole month. Uh, they will start the month on the back part of a homestand that starts in November, a five-game homestand. 
Then they'll go on the road to play Columbus, Toronto, Montreal. Then back home, Vancouver, St. Louis. Then they have a four-game road trip right around Christmas. San Jose, San Jose, L.A., Anaheim. And then they're coming back here on the 27th after the Christmas break to play the Oilers. Seattle back-to-back in Vancouver. And, Matt, there's a few times a season. Uh, we're doing it here in December with San Jose and then in January against St. Louis. I can't remember a time in the past when we played the same team twice in a row. Yeah. Like, I, I remember games, like, where we played, like, a home-and-home home versus, like, well, home-and-home, yeah, but it's, like, or, two in San Jose, and then in December it'll be two in St. Louis. Yeah. Or, and, sorry, in January. And that is weird, but... Uh, and it's been a number of years since it's happened, but you know, it has happened before it, but it is certainly odd. Cause it's like you, you, you play the one game, then you just kind of hang out for a day or two and then play again. It just, it you, usually one of the teams goes away for the day, you know, to play. Well, and especially on the California trip, like you could easily do say San Jose, then L.A., then San Jose, then Anaheim, or do San Jose, L.A., Anaheim, San Jose again, or something like yeah, that. Yeah, and we've had trips like that where we've done, like, the loop <laughs> one way or the other, like, go from Anaheim, L.A., San Jose, Anaheim again, or San Jose down and up. It It's just odd to just basically be hanging out in the area for a couple of days for no reason and then playing again. Yeah, so it's, it's, just, it, I mean, you are right. That is a very bizarre schedule for that. But, you know, at least you're getting the two out of the way and then you don't have to ever go there again. So positives. It's, uh, <laughs> I, you know, it should be, if you look at these teams, it should be an easy month for the Flames. Like if we look at these teams on paper, but well, with it, the way it, this frankly, team's... if you look at the Flames schedule and like the quality of opponents, the Flames actually have the easiest uh, re- uh, schedule of any team in the NHL. The rest of the way um so because basically for the first two months of the season the flames have playing been playing pretty much elite teams all throughout so which the fact that they're 500 through that's actually not bad <laughs> but um like we're gonna see the quality of the schedule like this month in january in february and march and definitely in april where all eight of the games are against bad teams um, yeah, you know, like the quality does drop off quite a bit for sure. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it should, it should drop off, but I think with the team playing the way they are, I think that we're going to see more struggle this month from the flames than we should. Yeah, and that's where like one of the main reasons why, like I personally would like to see this team, um, like do the Phillips recall sooner than later or, you know, whatever shakeup they have in mind, uh, just to kind of hopefully uh, enough of a kick in the pants to get the team moving sooner than later. Cause you know, like if you're looking at ahead, like all the way through to the Toronto game, like, you know, like that's another 10th of your season gone if like the flames are struggling through that segment, like that's another significant part of the season that you're kind of giving away. And, you know, like even if after that, you're starting to get on a roll when you're playing the Canucks, the sharks, the ducks, you know, on and on through the end of the month, you know, like it's starting to get into too little, too late mode. Not really, but, I, you know, like... It's... And with the Flames playing on Tuesday, and we'll talk about this week coming up here in, in our next bit, but with the Flames playing Tuesday and the uh, Wranglers, I'm impressed I said that right the first time, playing not till the weekend, I think it's the perfect time to make a call-up. The Wranglers are at home, Calgary be at home, do it, and if you need to, you can always undo it before the weekend. You can always send that guy back down. Yeah, well, like, uh, the Flames play on Tuesday and Thursday against Florida and Montreal, you know, trying out Phillips for the two games. You know, like, if he plays poorly enough where you immediately want to send him down, you can. Uh, I don't think... Or if you just want to try somebody different. Yeah. Like, anything, really. Like, the team just needs a bit of a shake-up. I agree. Well, let's talk about this week then. The Calgary Flames are back at home. They uh, have Matthew Kachuk and the Florida Panthers visiting them on the 29th, which is Tuesday, at 7 p.m. Calgary start time, back to normal game times. 
Thursday, the Montreal Canadiens come to town, another 7 p.m. start time. Saturday, obviously, Hockey Night in Canada, an 8 p.m. start time against the Washington Capitals. So we have three games this week. Um, I've already got my predictions locked in. Neither of us did well last week, but why don't I give you mine for this week? Sure. I think the Flames are going to win against Florida because I think there's going to be something to get excited for here with Kachuk coming back to town. Um, And I think they're going to beat Montreal, but I think they will lose to Washington. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to go a little bit different. I think they're going to lose to Florida, lose to Montreal, and beat Washington. Why do you think that? Um, I think this team uh, is, frankly, in the middle of a tailspin, and they're going to be struggling for a bit. And, you know, I think that by the end of the week, they might be having enough to click it back over. But... Uh, Montreal and Florida are both playing better of late, and I, I just Montreal especially. I think that game is going to be a lot harder than a lot of people are thinking it's going to be. And yeah, I could easily see the Flames drop four out of five on the homestand. Frankly, like it's one of those where like they need to get going sooner than later. Do you think it's fair to say that there will be more? fans in the building uh ready to i don't want to say boo but ready to make kachuk the heel than monahan the heel this week oh for sure like i i think that literally every time that kachuk touches the puck on tuesday that he will be booed and booed loudly um monahan i don't think because he didn't really want to leave and it was more of a Hey, we want to go sign Cadre. We need to move you, and yeah, you know, so that that's more of a just a pure and hockey. I know just trade. talking to people, people have even forgot where Monahan is now. Yeah, and you know, like uh, I'm glad that he's playing well, and you know, I'm hoping that he has a long rest of his career wherever he plays. But you know, it, it just economically it made no sense to keep him, and then getting an upgrade with Cadre, it, it yeah, definitely worth the first round pick that they moved. I, I agree. So we'll see what happens this week. Two former Flames coming to the Dome to, uh, I guess, pick up their stuff if they've left it in Calgary and also play the Calgary Flames while they're here. And then the Washington Capitals to cap off the week. Yep. And it'll, it'll be nice to see Ovechkin in the Dome. It's always nice to see uh, as he uh, gets closer and closer to tying Gordy Howe. I think he's like 13 away or 14 away now, so... It'd be interesting to see how uh, his season on that aspect goes. and It's going to be a tough and long week for the Calgary Flames. And, you know, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.